a person in the water. It could be a fellow crew member, a passenger, it could even be you. At any time, the ship's crew may need to recover people in distress from the water. They might be from your own ship, or from someone else's emergency. A vessel abandoned because of flooding or fire, or an aircraft that's come down in the sea. If they're out of range of shore-based search and rescue facilities, your ship may be the first or only available means of rescue. In cases like these, the crew may have to prepare to recover people, maybe a large number of people, at very short notice. Whoever they are, their lives may be in your hands. Falling overboard is an emergency. A person can quickly disappear from sight, and in many seas the water is so cold they'll die if they're not rescued promptly. Clearly, the best advice is to prevent falls in the first place, and there are some simple things you can do to protect yourself. When working at or near the ship's side, wear the correct personal protective equipment. PPE and take extra care, especially in heavy weather and when the decks are wet or icy. But even in good weather, it pays to remember safety. If there's any risk of falling over the side, you'll need a safety harness, a life jacket and someone to supervise you. And the bridge must be informed when the work starts and when it ends. On passenger ships and large ferries, there can be thousands of passengers and hundreds of crew. Every crew member is responsible for raising passengers' awareness of the risks of falling overboard. Seasickness, depression, alcohol consumption and carelessness can all lead to people going over the side. So always keep an eye open for unsafe behaviour. But what if someone does fall overboard? Any response must be both quick and effective. It has to succeed first time, or it could be too late for the person in the water. Everyone must know what they need to do and have practiced it in drills. It's not only sensible to be prepared, it's also mandatory. The International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, SOLAS, requires ships to have plans and procedures for the recovery of persons from the water, specific to their design and equipment. Regular drills must also be held to ensure the crew is competent in carrying out procedures and familiar with the required equipment the recovery plan should form part of the ship's onboard emergency procedures and be included in the vessel's SOLAS training manual. It does not have to be a separate document. It should be developed by consulting the IMO documents, Guide to Recovery Techniques and Guide for Cold Water Survival, and the International Aeronautical and Maritime Search and Rescue, IAMSAR Manual Volume 3. A typical recovery procedure will involve planning for recovery, the ship going to the distress area, providing assistance before the recovery, bringing the casualties to the side of the ship, getting them on board by ladder, lifting or rescue craft, and looking after the casualties once they are recovered. The primary objective is always to get people out of the water as quickly as possible, to reduce the risk of hypothermia. But rescuing anyone from water can be a risky operation. During a launch, 
the rescue craft crew themselves could be injured or crushed against the side of the ship. The casualty could be run over by the ship or the rescue craft, or be sucked into the propellers or thrusters. They could be hurt while being lifted from the rescue craft to the ship, or they could even fall back into the water. Completing a risk assessment is therefore essential for developing a recovery plan that minimizes the risk of injury to everyone involved. This should cover each phase of the operation, the anticipated conditions and any ship-specific equipment or characteristics. IMO guidelines also set down some specific factors to be considered when developing the procedures. These include the ship's manoeuvrability and freeboard, the areas on the ship to which the casualty could be recovered, dynamic issues such as the sea state and visibility, safe navigation, the availability of crew and PPE, and the types of equipment available for the rescue and how they could be used. Some ships will have specific equipment fitted for the recovery of persons from water but every ship must have a designated rescue craft, either a fast rescue craft or an assigned lifeboat, as long as its launching and recovery arrangements meet the SOLAS requirements for a rescue craft. The craft will need to be regularly inspected, tested and properly maintained. And whatever the type of craft, it must be equipped with thermal protective aids, TPAs, for a casualty recovered from cold water. Because every life-saving situation is different, other available equipment may need to be used in unconventional ways. For example, if recovery is not possible due to sea or weather conditions, life buoys or an inflated life raft attached to secure lines may be passed down to those in distress. A lifeboat or life raft left on its davits could also be used as a lift. Aboard passenger vessels, a marine evacuation system, MES, could be used to embark multiple casualties. The plan should also ensure that there is adequate lighting in the area where the recovery operation is to take place. A sample plan, risk assessment and flowchart are included in the workbook accompanying this programme. So what should you do if you see a person in the water? Keep them in sight and attract as much attention as you can. Shout repeatedly, man overboard or person overboard, and port side or starboard side as appropriate. Keep looking and pointing in the direction of the person, moving aft if necessary. Don't stop shouting until you are certain that someone has heard you. If no one hears you, contact the bridge as soon as you lose sight of the person in the water. And remember, if a lifebuoy is to hand, it should be thrown over the side. The response of the bridge will depend very much on the vessel's characteristics and its circumstances on the day. Here, an 80,000 ton LNG carrier sailing in ballast is in open water, 150 miles from land. With a length overall of 280 meters and a freeboard of 18 meters, the ship is fitted with a single rudder and has a maximum speed of 19 knots. The sea state is moderate and visibility is good. The designated rescue craft is the starboard lifeboat. As soon as it's reported that someone has gone over the side, a series of quick actions will be essential. Man overboard, starboard side. Man overboard, starboard side. Man overboard, starboard side. Understood? First, the global positioning system, GPS, MOB function should be activated as this will automatically record a datum point. 
if not already done so, a smoke float and life buoys should be released over the side. As soon as possible, the stern will need to be swung away from the person in the water and the ship manoeuvred to recover them, taking into account stability conditions and the ship's speed. Three long blasts should be sounded on the whistle. This not only warns other ships, but also helps to make the casualty aware that the ship is taking action. If a rescue craft is needed, it should be prepared for launching. And as speed and manoeuvring are required, the engineers will need to be informed of the situation. One minute, sir. Okay. One such manoeuvre, used to return the ship to the point where the person went over the side, is the Williamson turn, which takes the ship back as close as possible to its original track, but on the reciprocal heading. First, the rudder should go hard over towards the side on which the person fell, in this case the starboard side. When the ship is 60 degrees from its initial heading, the rudder should then be shifted full to the opposite side, in this case from hard starboard to hard port. The rudder should then be returned to the midship position, at the point where the ship is 20 degrees before the opposite heading. The course should then be stabilized as soon as the ship is on the reciprocal heading. Masters must ensure all navigating officers are competent in performing the Williamson turn safely. They must be familiar with the handling characteristics of their ship, including any restrictions on helm or speed when turning. For example, vessels with a high freeboard such as cruise ships or Ropax ferries, should consider a reduction in speed before making a turn under full helm. The Williamson turn can be effective when someone has been spotted overboard while the ship is underway. But what's the procedure when a person is presumed missing but wasn't seen falling overboard? Captain, your master, everyone is present except the steward. When someone is reported missing, the master will have to assume the worst and simply estimate the position where they fell overboard, based on time, wind speed, current, and when the person was last seen. The ship will have to turn back, notifying shipping in that area and the nearest rescue coordination centre that there is a person in the water. As the date and point given can only ever be an estimate, it's most likely that the ship will have to go into a search pattern. So it's essential that masters and navigating officers are familiar with search patterns. And not only because they may need to recover a person who's fallen from their own ship, they may also have to take part in a coordinated search and rescue operation. One pattern illustrated in the Ayansar manual, for use when the person's position is known within close limits, is the sector search. Starting from the datum point and proceeding on the reciprocal heading to the original course, the ship goes two nautical miles and then turns 120 degrees to starboard. Each turn in the pattern is a 120 degree turn to starboard. A further five turns over a triangular pattern brings the ship back to the datum point. If the first search is unsuccessful, the pattern is begun again, reoriented at 30 degrees to starboard. This pattern gives a very strong chance of detection close to the datum. It also spreads out the search very quickly over the probable area. Other search patterns for use in different circumstances are shown in the IAMSAR manual. Finding a casualty in an estimated search area is always a challenge. It requires as many people as possible to be posted on the high points of the ship to help spot the person in the water. But much will depend on the weather and visibility. At night, 
Searchlights will be needed to assist the lookouts. Where possible, search operations should continue until all reasonable hope of finding survivors has passed. When a casualty is sighted, the master should decide whether or not to go ahead with the rescue, based on a risk assessment. There will be times when the recovery operation could endanger the ship, its crew, or the casualties. If the conditions are such that the rescue craft cannot be safely launched, another option could be to let down an unmanned life raft on secure lines to provide casualties with protection and then standing by until a helicopter or rescue vessel arrives. Chief mate. If the master decides to proceed with the recovery, the rescue craft will need to be prepared. This might be a designated lifeboat, or, if the weather is suitable, a fast rescue craft. Whatever the type of craft, it must be capable of being launched within five minutes. The risk assessment covering launching and recovery should be reviewed and a toolbox talk between the boat crew and officer in charge must be held before launching. Rescue craft crew must wear the appropriate PPE and immersion suits. In water colder than 15 degrees Celsius, these need to be insulated. The master will by now have considered how the ship should approach the casualty and where and how best to create a lee for the rescue craft, depending on wind, sea or swell. Recovery should take place at a position clear of the ship's propellers and thrusters and, if possible, within the ship's parallel mid-body section. Once the craft is ready, the bridge is notified and, at the appropriate moment, the order to launch is given. The crew must be well trained and have practiced the launch and recovery of the rescue craft frequently. Their skill and training will also be essential when recovering the casualty from the water and into the craft. The first priority of any rescue operation is the safety of the craft crew. If any one of them becomes another casualty, the entire operation is put in jeopardy. Casualties should only be recovered from the water using the procedures defined in the recovery plan. Everyone who has tried it knows how difficult and physically demanding this part of the operation can be, even during a training exercise. But in a real emergency, extra care must be taken, as, depending on conditions, the casualty may be suffering from near drowning, hypothermia and dehydration. In a cold sea, they may be too weak to hold a line, so rescue craft crews must be trained in correct lifting techniques and the use of equipment such as Jason's cradles to help get the person into the rescue craft. If the casualty is conscious and not in danger of drowning, they should be kept in a horizontal deck chair position, not vertical, to reduce the risk of cardiac arrest in cases of hypothermia. If they are unconscious, they will be at risk of drowning and should be brought on board as quickly as possible. Once aboard the rescue craft, the casualty should be laid flat with their head to the stern to protect their heart and circulation when the craft makes way. They may also need to be kept warm with TPAs. Whether the casualty is unconscious or not, first aid based on the ABC principle will be needed. That is A, check airway, then B, for breathing, and thirdly, C, check circulation and pulse. If they're not breathing, then mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation must be started. Good first aid training is an essential skill of the rescue craft crew. 
For more information on recovering a casualty, see the accompanying workbook. Once the individual is in the craft, it too must be recovered. This is never easy, even when the ship is stopped in the water. In a seaway, the master will navigate the ship to provide a lee. If the risk is assessed as acceptable, the rescue craft can then be lifted on board. But if conditions change, or the weather suddenly deteriorates, it may be safest to wait for a helicopter to winch off the casualty, rather than attempt to bring the rescue craft alongside the ship. The recovery of rescue craft on some passenger ships and ferries can be difficult, as the distance from the water to the deck can be considerable. For this reason, these ships should consider using a specifically designed means of rescue raft, if fitted, to transfer the casualties. The ongoing care of casualties forms an important part of the recovery plan. Throughout the operation, they should be handled carefully. Rough maneuvering can kill a person in a critical condition. Anyone who's been recovered from the sea will be cold and wet and suffering from a certain degree of shock. The procedure for dealing with hypothermia should be followed, if applicable, and they should be kept lying down and under observation for possible breathing problems for at least one hour, no matter how well they say they feel. Not too bad, really. A person overboard emergency is a rare occurrence. But if it happens, the effectiveness and speed of the response will be crucial. It must go right first time. The recovery plan and procedures must be ship specific. The risks involved in the operation should be assessed. Rescue craft must be regularly inspected and properly maintained. Regular drills are essential and mandatory. Other available equipment may have to be used in unconventional ways. The recovery operation should take place well clear of the ship's propellers. The casualty should be handled carefully throughout, using a horizontal position, and they should be cared for immediately. Watch this video again and make sure you're competent in and familiar with the procedures set out in your ship's recovery plan. For more information on the topics covered in this program, please see the accompanying workbook and video tells related programs.